Thank you, Arnab, and thank you, Junoon. Is it loud enough? First of all, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? All right. So, at the end, for those of you who are interested, we have bought some microscopes. We'll show some worms to you, and you know, fruit flies and other things that our lab and other labs in TFR work on. Um, and I was really, really, actually excited to be asked to give this talk um, because I do understand that and I, I don't say this lightly I have watched Junoon sort of fanishly on YouTube for several years now and uh, it's a platform which clearly brings a lot of creative people example artists and more recently scientists so in the preview that I set up, what I said is that both artists and scientists are really people who attempt to understand the world around them and they try to describe it and they try to understand it. And I think in this, in this way, artists and scientists are very similar because we both try to describe and understand the world around us. But the other thing which it really came home to me when I was watching Sujay Ghosh, who's a filmmaker, as you know, is that we are both storytellers. We tell stories. We tell stories about things which we are either in the process or have discovered, right? And we like to share these stories. So today, like many others before me in the Junoon Forum, I'm going to share a story of some of the things that we've been doing in our laboratory. And I absolutely love Kithab Kahana. I've come here many, many times at this wonderful location. So what my lab and I am very interested are in the brain right and here's like a sort of a funny sort of uh, diagram of a brain and what really drives each of us in the lab and for people who want to study the brain is to answer questions so for any scientist typically the kind of question they want to ask and answer is how does something work Right? That's what you want to figure out. Is how does something work? Does it work by this or does it work by that? And you know, is this the particular way in which you know an ion flows in a wire? Or those are the kinds of questions. But it's always predicated by the why. And obviously, it's extremely important to know why is it that you want to study something. So I shall sort of through this, through my talk go through each of these questions separately. Why do we study the brain? How do we study the brain? And what have we found out? So I'm going to leave this. And please feel free to ask me questions throughout my talk. I'm, you know, please interrupt me. It's perfectly fine. I'm going to start with soliciting some ideas from you. Why do you think anybody should want to study the brain? What's so interesting about it? how the brain works. But what do you mean when you say how the brain works? Right? So when you start thinking about these questions, what we as individuals, either human beings, it could be elephants, it could be tigers, it could be the annoying cockroach that runs around in your house if you don't call the pest control guy, it can be a snake, it can be a bird. What we essentially do is look at the world around you, sense what is happening, try to understand or integrate that information, and then there is an action, right? So for instance, if you're a cyclist, you're on the road, and you're saying, OK, I have to go this way, I have to, you know, whatever, go at a certain speed if I want to win the race or this section of the race, right? So you're constantly integrating information. Or a lot of you will understand that this is the sun, and this is the beautiful picture of a sunset, a sun, you know, of a sunset or sunrise. If you're a dog, you probably look at a human being and say, you know, what are you doing? You came back from work. Why aren't you feeding me? Why aren't you taking me for a walk, right? Because even the dog communicates what it senses. You have come home. You know that this is feeding time because you've been fed every day at the same time, and you want to go out. Likewise, although I don't understand the American style thing of having orange juice in the morning, you start off your day in the morning with a newspaper and a cup of garam garam chai. Nothing could be better, right? So in effect, the nervous system allows you to perceive, the brain and the nervous system allows you to perceive the world 
and respond to it. Something which is uniquely present in all animals, in the entire animal kingdom. The other reason people are often interested in the brain is actually injury and disease. For instance, the Wright brothers were inspired by looking at birds fly and then you know, went on to then design aeroplanes and you know, humans have been fascinated with flight for such a long time. It came with the flip side of all the early experiments of all of the various people who were flying with lots of injuries because these little things would crash and I'll come back to this later when we talk about experiments. But the other reason is injuries not only of accidents, of car crashes, motorcycle crashes, aeroplanes falling off, from the sky, but stroke victims, people who have stroke and they can't speak and they can't walk anymore, right? It's because of parts of your brain have been damaged or neurodegenerative diseases. And here is a picture of a very fine athlete called Lou Gehring. He was, you know, one of the top baseball players in the US and a top athlete who contracted amyotropic lateral sclerosis, it doesn't, the name doesn't matter, he got a neurodegenerative disease. He ended up finally in a wheelchair, not being able to move, not being able to eat, and finally not being able to breathe because you, know, you need your neurons to function for your lungs to expand and compress. Right? So there are many reasons, not only because of the way you perceive the world and engage with it and all the emotions that you feel, the sense of joy, the sense of responsibility, the sense of irritation, but also because your nervous system working is extremely important for disease as well as injury situation. So let's take a little bit of a dive. I think pretty much, please tell me if anybody hasn't seen a brain picture. Has anybody not seen a brain picture? Everybody, I think, has seen a brain picture, right? And so this is like one little mass of cells. You can cut it. And what you will see here is, again, a little bit blob of something. You know, what are you going to gain from that? We actually know which part of the brain is very important to form memories. So if you take that part and then blow it up, you begin to see some structure. And it looks a lot like wires, right? Looks like little thin strands of something. You blow it up some more. And then you begin to see a cell, which is the smallest unit of you know, any sort of plant or animal living thing with projections that come from it, which look a lot like wires. So everybody has sort of seen this brain and have sort of devolved it into its elements. Literally, if you look at a brain, and here's a picture which came out recently from some studies from the Allen Institute. If those of you who know Paul Allen, he died recently. He was a big guy in Microsoft. And these are neurons, or these cells, with little projections that come out of it. They connect up with other neurons or cells, which also have exuberant wire-like projections. It is this repeated connection which finally gives rise to a circuit. These connections are what make a circuit. So your brain is a complex circuit made of wired connections which come from neurons. So all of you have an experience with the circuit. Okay, and I'll just tell you what that circuit is. It's something which many of you have studied in school. Maybe some of you have studied it and forgotten it. It's the spinal reflex circuit. So how many of you have had this you know, you're just walking somewhere and you go and hit your knee or your elbow and you withdraw it. You say, ouch. Pretty much everybody over here, right? And that is a circuit where you have a neuron which can feel that you have hit something or touched something. You can integrate that information saying that, ouch, it was a touch versus ouch, it hurt, right? And then take an action and move that body part out of the way, depending on whether you are scraping against someone in the train, in which case you don't have to worry about it, it's not going to hurt you, it's only going to squish you, or when you hit yourself against something, right? So this is an example of a wired circuit which allows you to respond to the world around you, right? To recognize when you're being squished versus when you're being injured. Okay, but when, let's take this, how does this communication between one neuron which wires onto another neuron actually take place. 
the, let's take the analogy of the wires further. How many of you have seen wires at home, right? And sometimes when you have these connections, I certainly see this with my iPhone wire. You know, every once in a while, it'll just very annoying little cables which will break and all those wires fray, right? So essentially, if you don't have the physical connection, you don't have electricity flowing. So what is it that happens in neurons in the brain is that you have these connections that occur at communication hubs where chemicals are released from these circular little blobs that you see here. This is the actual piece of information that we get from the animal and this is a schematized drawing. So these chemicals are what flow and allow one neuron in the circuit to pass information to another neuron in the circuit. So what happens in these wires? You saw those very beautiful blue wires that I showed you which came from Allen Institute. What happens in those wires? So when you can think of wires, this is a wire which you have right here, right? So these wires can also be thought of as pipes of some kind. So let's stretch your imagination and think of a situation where you have a garden which is very far away, you have a tap which is also very far away, you're standing somewhere in the middle where this little hose is flowing. You do not know whether this is a wire, like you see metal wires where you can't see anything, it's just solid piece of metal, or there's something happening within it. So here let me take a step back and tell you another mini story as to how people got interested in the wires which connected, you know, basically the circuits of neurons. It was because during World War II, you had all of these wonderful aeroplanes which were used to demolish cities, firebomb Dresden, whatnot, but there was a lot of collateral damage. Many of these small aeroplanes fell down, crashed with young men in it who had now catastrophic injuries in their spinal cord, in their brains, leading them not to be able to move or walk, some of them having serious mental health issues because of these injuries to their brain. So people who were scientists at that time, you know, these, these people were, had, were very healthy otherwise. So they're going to live for many, 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 many years with very difficult injuries. So people started looking at neurons and started saying that we really need to understand what these wires are. And it is that inspiration which led to the, what I call the garden hose experiment. You see these little pipes. You can think of these pipes as wires for conducting electricity or you can think of these pipes as dynamic, where things are happening, which is easier to see, okay? And I'll just give you an example. So what Paul Weiss, he was in the University of Chicago, what he did was a very simple and very elegant experiment. He said, I'm going to think of this as a garden hose in which water is flowing, all right? Water is flowing, and if you just constrict it, what would you see? And that's exactly what he did. He took one of these wires, put a little knot around it and then he saw he waited for some time and nicely it swelled up here and nicely it swelled up there. So you realized from this very simple and very elegant experiment which anybody can do who has a garden in a garden hose that there was flow of material taking place. Things were moving in this tube which was central to how you make a wired circuit. I'm going to show you a little movie here as to how it actually looks. Okay, here is something which is moving, here is something which is moving. There's a bunch of stuff which is just wiggling around, but you'll also see things which are moving if you pay attention, right? Here's something that's moving nicely. And these are the same little circles which had chemicals which allowed one neuron to communicate with another neuron, right? So this is what you see when you take a neuron and push it out. So you know that things are moving in it. And the things which are moving in it are little discrete objects which for the rest of the talk I will call as cargo. It's a very generic term, it's just basically a little piece of something which is moving around, all right? So how do these cargo move? Here is you seeing it in a neuron where you maybe sort of remove this, this top cover, right? Just like in your iPhone, you have this little top cover which is there, you remove it and then you see these twisted wires. So all you've done is remove the top cover and you can see this. But then people did this very nice experiment where they took the top cover out and they pushed everything apart. And lo and behold, what do you see? This little cargo moving along 
what I call our cellular roads, right? You can see lots of things moving around. You'll see something, that's one. If you pay attention, you'll see lots of other movements. There's movement here, there's movement here, there's movement here. And it's nice to be inspired by the real world. And I'm going to play you another movie which is basically just traffic on roads, right? I could almost imagine the things which are moving here are things which are moving over here as well. So I'll play this again for you, right? So that's a very interesting analogy, something for us to think about. So if you think about roads in India, the dominant feeling you, most of our roads are not like this, right? Most of our roads are not so broad with so many roads and so many lanes and very orderly people. It's not like that. And in fact, when you look within neurons and you look deep in using a high powered electron microscope, what you see, these are the roads, by the way. These are those big roads. These are those big roads on which those cargo were moving. But you have all kinds of mess close by. In fact, these things seem to be very precariously perched on the roads. These giant little pieces of cargo are precariously perched on small little roads. It's like this massive container truck moving on a narrow little road. It almost looks like that, right? So what you realize by looking at pictures such as this is neurons, roads in neurons are very, very crowded. And God knows how things move. So let's go back and look at this place where the neuron has been completely separated out, where you can look at things moving. And let's look at this and say, are there similarities that you see? What will happen if you collapse all of this together, which is the way it is inside the cell, inside the neuron? Or the other way to ask the question, are there traffic rules in neurons? So I'm going to stop over here and again ask all of you the question. Do you think there are traffic rules in Indian roads? I want at least one person answering. Tell me one traffic rule. One unbreakable traffic rule. Red is stop. Red light. Red light? No one stops. <laughs> ah, I said one unbreakable traffic rule. That is a breakable traffic rule. So Gaya comes here. Some one example. I think you'll sort of see where I'm going with it shortly. No, no, Arnab is not allowed. <laughs> One scientist can't answer another scientist. Don't stop for, for the traffic stop. Then you are in trouble. Ah, that's a very interesting idea. But you know, you can always say that you can drive past and just throw to like throw five thousand rupees on the side. Traffic cop will be doing this. I know we can say that most of them will let you go without even stopping. Okay, so we can we can ignore him. Right? We can ignore him. We should not. And those are the rules of the land. But we can. What is an unignorable thing? Slip. Hmm? Slip. If you slip, what do you... Oh, if you sleep. If you sleep, you'll have an accident. So it's not an unignorable thing. That's a catastrophic thing, right? Where essentially the driver falls asleep. Okay. But there are ways to think about this. You can have local rules, like the traffic red light, or global rules, which it doesn't matter locally what you're planning to do, but globally we know, for instance, that we need to actually pay attention to the traffic cop. But I'm going to show you an example, which is an unbreakable traffic rule, okay? But before we go ahead and do that, we can ask all kinds of questions, right? What are the rules? Are we going to be inspired by what happens around us? But scientists, like to find answers. Answers of exactly how it is doing, not only an inspirational answer based on possibilities. For that, we come to the second half. We asked why is it important to study the nervous system and how is the nervous system laid out? How do we study the nervous system? I presented you the traffic problem, so one way you might want to think about how you want to study it is much like the drone footage that I showed you of traffic, right? If you could just go and watch what is happening inside the neuron in an animal, you could do it. Except you can't send a drone inside the animal, no? The animal is very small. You could, I mean, I wouldn't want, want a drone going inside me. 
and is delivering some mes messages or material to live. What you can do is take a very simple approach that I'm going to watch, but I'm going to be aided by painting, for instance, all the cars white and all the trucks red, all the auto rickshaws pink, all the cycles in some other color. And here, for instance, we marked one of the cargo in white, which is present in very large numbers in a communication hub. Okay, And the communication hub is where these chemicals are released, which allows your nervous system circuit to function. Okay, fantastic. We've marked it. But this, this, look at this. We can't see anything moving. We can see the whole animal moving. And I'll show you some animals like that if you want to see afterwards. You can see the animal moving, which is not the traffic that is moving. So for that, you need a better or a more powerful microscope. You hold the animal in place and you do the version of the drone, except now you're using light and cameras. And what you see is cargo happily moving in both directions. Neurons are, remember, thin wires. But there's a lot which doesn't move also. Huh? So focus on the things which don't move as well. So now we have the means to observe what we are, one of the things we're interested in studying, which is very, very important, because that's how you conclude unambiguously that something is right. Okay, that's very, that's, that's, I would say that's the craft that comes into being a scientist. Okay, here is it. Booing in both directions and cargo that doesn't move. There's a whole pile of it. Here's another bit of cargo that doesn't move and there's plenty which is moving in both directions. Okay. We have moved from why we study the brain, how we can study individual neurons, and finally, I'm going to talk about what is it that we found? Okay, what we found was exactly like Indian do roads, right? You can paint some cars white, then you paint the trucks in red. I said you can paint the auto rickshaws in pink, but if you are in a traffic jam, you will find red is mixed, is white, is red, is pink, right? So we looked at two different cargos. Here marked in green and here marked in red. We can see that there are places where only the red cargo is stopped, where only the green cargo is stopped, but there are places where both of them are stopped together. And this is exactly what you would see in real life, that your traffic jams have different kinds of cargo in it or different kinds of vehicles in it, precisely what you're seeing inside the neuron. Okay. So let's go back to the next thing. And now you, I'll explain this movie to you. But the analogy that I want you to think about, which might explain a little bit better how to think about this problem, is any market road. The one that I frequently visit is the Kolaba market road. If you go in the Kolaba market road, and you know where Janata bookstore is, you see that on both sides, the road is actually fairly broad. But on both sides, there are people who sell fruits and vegetables sitting on the side. So what ends up happening if a car goes there? What do you think might happen to the car? Jam. jam. One, one car is enough, you'll have a jam. Right? You don't even need five cars. You don't need a hundred mile traffic jam in China style. A car se kaam ho gaya. You're jam. And this is precisely what you're going to see. So this green stuff that you're seeing over here, and it'll keep looping, is the equivalent of the fruit and vegetable sellers that you would see on normal roads. Okay? And then you have this little cargo, which is nicely coming, comes and stops, because you can't go further. You can look here. Here's another example. Here's a red cargo, which comes, reaches the place where all these fruits and vegetable sellers are, stops, cannot go further. Have you thought of the unbreakable rule now in traffic? The unbreakable reality. Right? I want to emphasize two things, okay, and I'll come back to the unbreakable reality. This is a normal, healthy neuron. It's not sick. It's doing beautifully. It's what's present in, you know, normal people who are doing the full spectrum of life or a normal C. elegans or a normal, you know, worm or a fly or anything. It's a perfectly healthy, normal neuron. So traffic jams in neurons are normal. Traffic jams in our life are normal as well. 
and one unstoppable rule is if you do not have enough space your vehicle cannot go through that is the unbreakable rule of traffic right if you have something which occupies the space in front of you like it can be either a fruit seller it can be an auto rickshaw which is badly parked it can be a car but if there isn't space you cannot move and we think that in neurons in such locations where you have certain kinds of proteins you cannot move okay what happens if you cannot move please tell me many of you are going to be drivers over here or sat in an uber or a ola or a black and yellow taxi you get into something where you see that there is not enough space to go through you have reached the un you know unbreakable traffic rule what are you or the driver going to do hmm ha ah, irritated yeah but irritated is not going to get you to your destination na that's wonderful you are sensing this you're getting irritated because you can't take an actionable item ha huh? get out and walk okay let us say you can't walk you look for a way around what kind of way around you just wait it out all good idea right you can wait it out if there is no other way if there is another way you will go reverse huh reverse reverse fantastic and what do you think happens in neurons here is a little cargo again these are all the fruit sellers the green things are the fruit sellers and the vegetable sellers who block the road and it will loop again so don't worry and the red is the cargo and you can see it's like bechar it's coming there cannot go through goes back tries again okay so we we'll look at it it'll it'll loop again and so we'll see it when the arrow shows up again we'll see it and you'll see the whole thing that the poor little cargo tries to do and i have to say that we human drivers will not try that hard huh? okay right here red trying trying goes back front nothing much is happening little progress it okay fine god one jagah se to nikal gaye back to another jam and go back and then fourth and then back and then fourth and sort of stuck not basically reached a place where it is, you've reached the immovable object right there's no space for it to go through so essentially what we are seeing is many of these cargo appear to be functioning the way you would when you are driving your vehicles or your you know taxi driver is driving your vehicle which are all local decisions okay so one aspect here we talked about is going backwards the other aspect one can think about is if you try another road and a neuron and here's a little picture has many roads you can try okay is this each of this is one road so this particular neuron has over 50 to 60 roads right running in parallel with each other but all very close to each other right so it's not so easy to use but still there are options right so what would happen how would you change your road would would that local decision help in getting out of traffic jam okay so here it is here's the experiment which is run as a si computer simulation experiment where you say nothing people can't go backwards they can't do anything that means eventually if you run into some kind of you know kalwaba market like situation everybody is going to stop and here is the experiment where you start changing roads and you still see you have traffic jams they are normal present in healthy neurons but you can still get enough flow you're not completely blocked and this is an extremely important take home that i would like you to keep in mind okay so what we are going to do right now with several of my students who have put together this live action please don't expect you know bollywood style really polished stuff but we shall try our best to sort of bring home what is it that's happening within neurons because this is part of the lived experience that we have so traffic jams how are how are traffic jams formed and how do cargo behave at traffic jams and everything i've said to you so far talks about local decisions so here we start 
so these red roads okay are the roads that you have in the neurons those little circles that i talked to you about and now we are going to have the vegetable and fruit seller i gather who is also another pink chunni i don't know what they have planned for this i should have looked a little bit more carefully all right we have a little bit more in the end we're talking linking all of this to circuit so it's not uh, maybe 10 more minutes okay so these are all the vegetable and fruit sellers as you see they are blocking the roads all right they're blocking the roads right now we have a first cargo coming and you sort of hit the immovable object the second cargo coming and he just decided doesn't want to go anywhere parked in more or less on the middle of the road third cargo coming walking behind but cannot really move because there's no space in front because there's one cargo already present over there and now comes cannot do anything goes back just like that vesicle in or what you might do hopefully not going back and forth hundreds of times like you know i don't think in indian roads we'd have the luxury of going back and forth so many times as the poor vesicle did then i think one of the vesicles which is right in the front moves away and when it moves away this individual can move forward at least a little bit right so these are all local decisions being taken but is that the only decision you can take what about global decisions and the global decisions that we as human drivers do is when you look at google maps right you will say i'm going to take this road home oh my god there is a block over there one of two things i'll take a different route or there is going to be a block there it looks like it's congesting over there so let me go faster so sometimes what we have seen in our experiments is in under certain conditions when we say have a lot of stimulation and the nervous system has to work very hard to communicate messages here we'll show it as a it'll suddenly zip past very fast so amal who is the last of the cargo is going to walk as i understand very fast through it and all of these cargo which are stationary will begin to start moving because what we think is that the ability to move is somehow improved in some way okay we don't understand that so that's still part of what is ongoing work and we haven't understood it so this is precisely what we are trying to show by using cars on walking on roads right that you actually don't have the physical space to move forward and so you get jammed those are local decisions but you can also have global decisions so the last few slides that i'm going to describe what i described is what traffic jams are present in healthy neurons but that's one neuron and we have 100 billion neurons in our brain why should one or few neurons in a circuit care about what happens in why should it affect the circuit so how this neuronal connectivity just allows us to sense integrate and transmit information allows us to run away from pain recognize our emotions and hopefully at least in some cases act productively about them why should movement in single or few neurons matter okay so we're trying to close the loop back where we started why study the brain to why we studied this process we see traffic jams are normal in healthy neurons traffic jams are normal in indian roads as well and probably even good because you have pile up of cargo staying place and those can be used in interesting ways we won't go into that today very much these are actual experiments do you recognize all of these wires much like what you see in the brain which i showed you earlier in a normal brain when you experience things you can remodel this entire connectivity and in extreme cases like here you remodel such that all of these go away and become simple and then it regrows okay and this is based on either developmental cues that is as you're growing up or things that you learn or memories that you form now you have this mutation or this disease neuron where you can't move things 
And yeah, you're fine in the beginning, but this shrinkage and all of that doesn't take place. And in fact, you're not able to withdraw all the processes almost as if you have excess connectivity being present. And excess connectivity is thought of to be one of the reasons why you have autism spectrum disorder. So things that move within individual neurons can have really profound effects on how things form and are maintained. Now let me tell you about this neurodegenerative example now in human brains. And again, I'm going to show you moving things, okay? This is a young normal brain, a no normal neuron, human neuron. Happily, things are moving around. This is an older neuron, let's call it middle-aged. Happily, cargo is moving around in both directions, right? This is the disease neuron which that athlete, the baseball player, Lou Gehring had. It's the same disease. And when you're young, you're doing fine. Things are happening. It's a neurodegenerative disease, so as you get older, it gets worse. And now look at this older neuron. There are very few things moving. There are many more traffic jams. You can see that so much more is stuck in the neuron without moving, which means that other cargo which move will also get stuck over there, no? Because there's no space to move. Okay, what's happening to these patients who have these problems? As the disease, when they go from younger to older, their ability to walk decreases, their ability to talk decreases, their ability to swallow decreases, and their ability to move decreases. If you want to study such things, we can't always cut open the human being and do experiments, but that's predicated by the fact that what you see in simpler animals is really what you see in these kinds of situations. So here, when you look at a middle-aged worm neuron, which again doesn't move cargo very well and there are traffic jams, now disease traffic jams, you see that they're not able to move much, whereas a normal animal which is also middle-aged, it's actually doing quite well. Okay, you know, if you actually look at a younger animal, it will do even better, but it's doing quite well. It can happily go about doing all of its activities of daily living, but not this one. So what you see is this way of studying problems to do with brain injury and brain disease, which depend on circuit formation, that depend on individual neurons performing consistently well throughout the life of the organism. And finally, but not, there's some heartbreaking examples. You can look at the KIF18 Twitter page, or you can look at KIF18 Kids, which is a very nice website. Uh, but there are many, many others. You can look at the Alzheimer's patient website, or you can look at the Lou Gehring disease patient website. There are many, many such things. But those Alzheimer's and Lou Gehring affect adults as they're aging more frequently. But here are patients, young patients, who do not have the ability to carry out movements. Their cargo cannot move very well. And what you see is that they grow up with developmental defects. In this case, this young boy is not able to walk at all properly. And here is an older boy who, you know, which teenager is going to be in a swing with a restraint unless they had a problem and they didn't have sufficient muscular control. So there are twin issues of not developing properly and getting worse as they get older. So the fact that your individual neuron has to work well so that your circuit can work well is an exceptionally important thing to keep in mind. Okay, take home, very simple, I've said this many times, traffic jams are real and can have major consequences. If you have too many traffic jams, your cargo flow will be blocked. You will have the 100 mile traffic jam and nothing will move forward. And I shared with you also how traffic jams in individual neurons can affect an entire circuit of many thousands of neurons because you will not be able to carry the chemicals that you need to make that circuit function. And what I shared with you so far is the story of the science. I'm going to take a step back and make you sort of think about the story behind the science. Scientists are often projected as people who are very dispassionate, very, very interested in what they do, and you know, but they look at everything objectively. 
which is really not true. We are also human beings first, and we are inspired by many things around us. And this story that I shared with you today of Traffic Jam actually started when I was speaking to someone who has become a very, very dear collaborator for over a decade, who is a theoretical physicist. I'm a neurobiologist. I have nothing in common, even in my training with a physicist. So I remember coming and showing him these movies. And in fact, one of the simulations that I showed where there was different places cargo could go was done by his group. And I would say that, you know, I really want to understand this. I don't understand these parts of the problem. There are so many things moving here, less moving there. And every time he would look at my movies and say, why are things not moving? And I said, you know, you're not supposed to look at that. You're supposed to look at the moving stuff. Why are looking at this stationary stuff? Everybody sees it. The whole world sees it. There's nothing interesting over here. And every single time, and finally, you know, after about six months, I really felt like a fool. I said, I, you know, I can't even answer this basic question. There's something really wrong. And then it ended up being a journey where we realized that physical constraints, that if you don't, this is the unstoppable logic of traffic, right? If you don't have space, you can't go ahead. It's not the red light. It is not the traffic police. If you can bypass all of that, you will if you have to get somewhere. But it doesn't matter what emergency you have. If there isn't space for the vehicle you are in to go through, your only option is to get into a smaller vehicle, get out and walk, or in the case of the cell, just stop. Right? And traffic jams need not be bad. They are naturally occurring. Maybe it gives us a moment to realize that we should not be irritated about what are naturally occurring phenomena, mm -hmm. like summers in Bombay and the huge rains in Bombay, if I might say. But they could also be, and maybe someday I'll have a chance to speak in Genoa again. We think that the small buildup of traffic actually might be useful for a normal, healthy cell. OK, with that, I'll end. It would not have been possible Without the work itself would not have been possible. Uh, really, what I call Stri Shakti, all of the people who lead, led the project over these years was a former postdoctoral fellow, Kausalya, who works in Perla Ra, which Mark Cuban just funded uh, with huge sums of money to identify, you know, for rare neurodegenerative diseases to find cures for it. So she now works in that in San Francisco. Parul, who's just a PhD student who's just about finished, and my master's student, Ketana, who sort of arranged this thing. And of course, none of it would have been possible without somebody keeping on asking me, but I don't understand this. Why are you seeing cargo which are stationary? And this is our lab's logo, which was made by a former master's students. And nothing would be possible without money and TFR. Thank you. And I'm really open to taking any questions at all. Yes. How are you doing it? I believe these are live. Uh, yes. So could you we, yeah. how the study is done? So we mark, as a, that's why I called it painting. We, if you have any biology background, what we do is in tag proteins with fluorescent proteins. We work in a transparent organism. And we developed imaging chips, which we showed. We just trap the animal. We image it. We just watch it. And then we let it go. And then we can do manipulation. So we can, for instance, remove certain proteins, put back certain proteins, color proteins, different things. And so we can actually do observe, but also manipulate. So these animals are like guinea They're very small. We'll show them to you afterwards. They have one millimeter long C elegans. It's a soil, free living soil nematode. It's just a worm which lives in the soil. Doesn't do anything. You can, I mean, it's not infective in any way. Oh, yes, I forgot to say, it's transparent. See? <laughs> so you can see it. You can just put it under the microscope. Right. So, uh, with cargo, you were referring to neurotransmitters, right? With cargo, I was actually referring to synaptic vesicles, Vesic endosomes, all of those kinds of things. Okay. But, uh, and with the traffic or sort of the fruit sellers, you were referring to... Actin. We were actin. Actin, actin. actin so, network. Uh, 
So we don't think it's purposely created and one of the things that we see is that the traffic jams don't arise due to the fruit sellers. Okay. Traffic jams can also arise just because of cargo stop due to various reasons, right? For instance, that's why the analogy that I gave was an auto rickshaw which is parked in a crazy way or a truck which is stopped. It doesn't matter as long as there's a space constraint. It's just that where you have these fruit sellers, you tend to make more traffic jams. So your, it's a, the analogy to Indian roads is exact in this case, right? You can have normal flow, you can have some occasionally not very good drivers who will, you know, span two lanes and stop in the middle, then you are stuck and you will find a way around. Or you can have people who occupy the road as the only free space, including pedestrians, which constrict the amount available to flow. And each of this gives you greater probabilities of stalling. Okay, so when I say traffic jams can be useful, what we actually saw was a large number of these synaptic vesicles, things which contain the chemicals for allowing the neuron to talk to another neuron. When we sort of stimulate the circuit, the number of vesicles that was stopped just reduced. There was no change in active. So it seems as if the mechanism of how you would actually move is somehow related to you know, must be getting activated in some way. So you can bypass these traffic jams. It's like you're suddenly, the way I would say is that now you are in a flying car. You can just leap. Except you're of course still attached to the road, but so that's the one. Remains, but the, synaptic, the, the, the traffic remains, the traffic, the actin remains. So the fruit sellers remain, okay. but you're able to bypass it. Maybe you're able to push through further. Maybe you're going very fast and you look like an aggressive driver, so the fruit seller gets out of the way perhaps, but you're not gone from there. So we don't know the answers to that. That's all ongoing work. Yeah, just wait for the moment. You make science very interesting. I'm a teacher, so I was more interested in that. Uh, is there any external sign? All you talked about is your psychological work and the details. But for a real man, um, whether it is that organism, because in my own family, I have a mental wife. Yes. And she was one of the brightest, yeah. one of the greatest scientists in the ARC. And uh, last six years, every day it was a different thing for yes. us. But then, are there any early signs in a model system which can give an indication that you have a problem inside? To then relate to a higher organism, the like human being would be a little different. But then with the model system, you said see aliens, Maybe zebra fish also be a good system, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so can you tell your experience with sea elephants? So what I can tell you is experiments that I now did more than 10 years ago myself and I can say, speak with confidence about that. And those were the animals that I showed, the middle-aged animals which were not moving. What was very curious to see is when they first grew out and for a very long time, I you know, usually work with young animals, so I didn't spot it. But I realized it was just keeping the plates and I figured out that there were these clumps which were forming in the neurons which I could actually see when I did cytological work and now we can see by doing this live imaging work. I realized that this animal was slowing down what I would call late youth. Um, for neurodegenerative, motor neuron neurodegenerative phenotypes, you see small changes in gait which you can pick up. There is no cure. For Alzheimer's, people have been trying for a very long time to do an eye-based test. And I have to tell you, for many of these neurodegenerative diseases, you develop a mouse model, you develop a drug on a mouse model, it goes all the way to a human patient, and it gives you improvement of six months. And you would say, what is six months? Not a cure. For those patients, so six months is very important because it allows them to put their affairs in order and a chance to say goodbye in a way which is a little bit more. So I think there are some very, very important things. There's also this study which somebody else is uh, doing where even this study which I showed, they put something called sorbitol, which is, a, you know, which is just a chemical. And they were able to replay, you know, they were able to reverse some of these defects. Now it's going to reverse defects in human patients. What you see in a laboratory 
before it gets to the patient, rightly so, there are so many steps before you get there. I personally think that those two groups of people have to work much more together, especially in India, so we can make meaningful progress. Because currently, you do the basic science and you can get a mechanism, you can understand something, but the problems of solving how to get the drug into the right place in the right way, whether does it have side effects, is a whole nother ball game with different skill sets and different kinds of training that's needed. The traffic jams came out earlier this year. And uh, we also look at, this is just one of the problems we study. But the traffic jams is the one which is easiest to communicate to non-scientists because I think it's, as I said, the parallels are exact and there is real, we, we do this every day in our life. So I think we can sort of see where you can both get inspired by it. And we still haven't discovered the Google map version of it, of alternate things, and to be even able to ass assess whether that happened. Okay, Use the mic yourself. Uh, so I'm really confused. So when you said there is another pathway, I'm looking at an individual neuron. Another pathway is within the neuron, you can jump onto another road. So if you know any biology, those roads are actually microtubules within the neuron. And so as I showed you in one of the cross sections, you can have as many as 50 roads. Not all of them can be used, but at least several of them can be used. How easy is this to maintain in the lab? I, I personally think it's very easy. Very easy. Way easier than zebrafish and mice and all of that. And cheaper? Oh, of course, much cheaper. In fact, that was a decision I made when I was finishing my PhD. I said, I might want to go back to India and I want to pick a model system which A, I'm not allergic to, and B, is not very expensive. And worms fit it, and it's transparent, so you can really look at things inside living. As you said, it's no point looking sometimes at pathological specimens because you can't see it as it's happening, and sometimes to really understand something, you have to see it as it's happening. And I don't think any of this would have been possible unless we had, we were the, we were, the experimenter was like the drone here, you know parked on top of the neuron and just looking and counting, lot of counting. Uh, I have a different question from all of the cases, so, so because they are very interesting. Uh, like, I have a question related to memory and you know, information yes. that we get and like, where do they get stored or like, you know, because we can access some uh, childhood memory. Right now, we can. So, where they are so, 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 finally, you have the entire neuron changes. So, some of the early, so these are some of the ideas which are there. Which, I mean, you probably know that there was a Nobel Prize given for working in the area of memory to Eric Kandel, who started looking at it in anaplesia, which is like a you know, marine animal. So early memories are often stored locally at the communication hub. With time, you have the idea that you've had an event, go back to the cell body and make major changes in gene expression. So how, what proteins are produced, how many are produced, the entire neuron changes. And that seems to be the way that you can hold long-term memories, that your neuron itself is still a neuron, but it changes state. You, we also see when you look at a neuron, even a rat neuron, if you keep looking, a neuron is not something, it's, it's not a building, it's a living thing. So it's constantly changing and remodeling. So the communication hubs form, break down, form, break down, become bigger, become smaller. Do those sorts of changes also provide real information, content in how long or how well you store memory? We don't have the answers to that. But we at least know that short term is very local in just the communication hubs. Long term means information from the communication words goes back to the same cargo process and other kinds of process along these wires 
go back to the cell body and make big permanent changes. Uh, is it relevant that when a, a neuron dies, a so clearly when you see with Alzheimer's patients, you see loss of neurons, you see big protein clusters which are present both inside the neuron and outside the neuron. And you know, the neuron essentially slowly begins to die. Or if you look at Parkinson's, there too neurons begin to die. So if they're very critical elements of the circuit, we often have overcapacity. But at some point their overcapacity is not enough. You have 100 billion neurons. Often when, often what happens is by the time we spot the phenotype, you know, you see something and you ignore it, right? Yeah. And then it becomes much worse. By the time even the first symptom comes, you often lost a lot of neurons, which is why there's a huge push to see whether you can tell. So I'll tell you for Parkinson's disease, there is this uh, woman, we don't understand the mechanism at all. There's this woman who was right like 90% of the time by the smell of the patient, she could tell that they're going to develop Parkinson's. We don't know how that works, but it seems to be empiric. But there's only one of her, yeah. right? That means there are changes which are taking place, but we don't know how to spot them or where they are. So there are many, many subtle things which are happening. We, we don't understand. So I describe the circuit, the spinal circuit is very simple, right? It's just few neurons occurring all the way. Real circuits, like, but not just movement circuits, but when I'm trying to understand motion, they are spread over all areas of the brain. You literally have 100 billion neurons. Which areas are connected to which area and how they talk together and if things change, where are all the changes going on? We don't still know the answers to that. We're getting better. We have better and better tools, but it's still not humans. So in the summary, consider the simpler things. Like I think we are doing better with the simpler things as to how individual neurons function and how simple circuits function. We are doing better. With truly complex things, we are still not doing very well in being able to understand it. And one last question is, so uh, the memories or uh, information you are saying, so the cargo you are referring to, is it the same or it's... It doesn't matter what the cargo is. Literally it doesn't matter whether you are auto rickshaw or truck or, you know, truck. So cargo you are referring to? Referring to anything which moves. Okay, but what I showed majority of are the cargo which are present at communication hubs in large amounts and have the chemical called neurotransmitters. So those cargo are specifically called synaptic vesicles, the communication hubs are called synapses and the chemical which is present inside them is called neurotransmitters. We just use a high-end compound microscope with a nice camera. Not this kind of nice camera, but a, you know, a very high-end camera where you can collect low-level lights because we're looking at fluorescent proteins. And do you have to light up the subject here? Yes, we put a little little animal either in a chamber, which I showed you where you know, it was just, I can, I can play that back again, um, where it was wriggling and we yeah, can yeah. capture it. Yeah. Or we can also um, put it on a slide and anesthetize it and look at it. So any one of those things will work. And here's one of our chambers. We can just tap it. You turn on fluorescent light. We're not looking at it with this kind of light. We're looking at a different light source, which is a different color, range of colors. And then you have fluorescence as a process take place from these molecules, and we just watch. And um, what is the role of the So, I always was interested in genetics, and when I was very, very young, I think, I think I was 12 when I decided that I wanted to be a scientist and I wanted to study genetics. Very foolishly, I knew nothing, really. <laughs> Honestly, I knew nothing, but just from reading newspaper articles. And I'd also seen when I was growing up, people who had, somebody in our neighborhood had children who had Down syndrome, and they had motor neuron type. There were another kid who had problems walking, and it seemed like, it would be really exciting and interesting to figure these things out. People didn't know enough. When I went to graduate school, my interest was slightly different. I ended up working in a lab which studied neurons. And once I started working on them, I fell in love. I couldn't think of anything else that I would ever want to do. And I sort of stuck with that more or less. I mean, I do many things, but neurons are it. I mean, how can you not care about them, right? This is exactly why I asked, why should you want to study the brain? We all have our favorite reasons, but I don't think there'll be any individual who will say the brain should not be studied. 
you know they might say yeah yeah don't study this you know little worm don't study zebra fish they may say all of those things they never going to say the brain is something you should not study and i think it's just so fascinating there's so many questions i'll never run out i'll be dead and still there with lots of questions to answer and i just so fertile that means i can have as much fun as i want today study this 10 years later study something again good fun so you know we've heard about looking at worms and zebra fish and all flies how far are we to looking at what is actually happening in a human brain So I'll tell you some of the things which are going on right now, and I think there are groups which, with people especially who have epilepsy, where you want to, you know, sort of reduce the incidence of epilepsy. So you have to go in surgically and remove the foci and remove some of the neuron tissue where you have these, you know, epilepsy is fit. All of you probably know. in such patients you can record from other regions which you can actually go in and record and get some uh, information this kind of imaging that we are talking about still not in humans okay the other thing you can record is put what many people in eegs they do or cat scans you can get that kind of information the other kind of information is that you do behavioral tests and you look to see which part of your brain lights up when you're given you know radioactive glucose so then certain part of the neuron brain will light up more and say oh this part is very important for distinguishing you know angry faces from happy faces for instance right so we have that kind of information broad brush strokes what the allen institute and few other people are doing is trying to make an inventory of all the cells which are there in the brain in fact that picture that i showed you this this picture comes from them the blue one it's absolutely to me it's like one of the most beautiful pictures that you can ever imagine here right it's so pretty and they are now going and finding out all the proteins which are expressed in every cell type how many cell types are there because even basic information is something we don't have properly we don't have a good inventory so that inventory is being built i think there will be times what we have is what i showed you here there is this stem cell technology which all of you must have heard of it is using technology like stem cell very close to stem cell technology where you take cells from one part from the patient and then you make them into neurons in a dish where you can now start to get this kind of detailed information so we are still very far from getting detailed information in situ in the brain you can do some recording we can do cat scans we can do fmri but all of that being integrated together still takes some time more questions yeah the back hello um i am an electrical engineer actually and so i always saw these things as uh, impulses electrical impulses yeah. so thank you for telling in biological terms to me so what happened was um, Uh, a year back, I felt like my learning skills were a little jam. So I would read two sentences and just forget them there, and again come back and again read it and forget. So I went on to Vipassana, which is my meditation technique. So I went for it. After that, I kind of started reading them properly, but then still felt jam. And soon after that, I stopped recollecting my childhood things. Okay. So after that, I just let it be and just took it easy. But now I recollect everything. so i i'm not a doctor so i should i should say that diagnosis is something which i absolutely should not do as to as to what is normal and not but what one knows about the nervous system ex well is that stress is a huge player in how your neurons integrate information how they sometimes act on the information and how they store their information in fact there is uh, vidita vaidya who has two junoon talks by the way um, as well as chai and why online if you want to see who works on some of these um, some of these problems early life stress is particularly very bad because it sets you up essentially to have very difficult ways to deal with further stress that you need but independently when if you you know in the normal range of stress when you have stressful events 
the way your nervous system responds is very different. You also have the neuroimmune axis, which also gets compromised. So I would think of the nervous system as not only sense, integrate, transmit in terms of what you get as information outside of yourself, but also sense, integrates, transmits to information within yourself. So how is it that your gut moves? You're not telling it to move. No, it just happens automatically. There is a certain wave that happens within that. And so those are all ways in which the nervous system functions. So therefore, the internal status of your body is going to have effect on how your nervous system is going to, going to function. And of course, one of the things that we most easily perceive are emotional state changes and learning and memory states changes, especially if you're a young person and it's very critical for you to get through that period of your life. No more questions? You want to see worms? If you want to see worms, I have students who've got worms and flies. They have worms, fruit flies. You and also have another microscope with some random other biological leaves. Can you just request? Yes. Oh yes, of course, of course. Uh, let's yeah. go to that. Let's, let's